Aloha friends! Imagine you're in a small sailing canoe out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean with no land in sight. No smartphone GPS to guide you, no maps, no compass, and you've never even been to your destination, a tiny island in the middle of this ocean. All that's guiding you is a story some old timer told you about the star positions and subtle ocean currents and fish and bird migration patterns to find your way. Would you be more than a little worried about getting lost at sea? I'd be screwed. I can only identify a couple constellations, and I'm not the greatest fisherman either. Incredibly, this is exactly how the Polynesian people were able to navigate between tiny islands in the Pacific Ocean thousands of years ago. While they didn't have GPS satellite guidance, their cultural technology was very advanced in a different way. So lately I've been thinking a lot about navigating the future. Like the Polynesians, we have no GPS technology or physical compass to guide us towards the best future. So it seems like we'll need to rely on triangulation from many different stories to find our way. So here's a story for you. Once upon a time, I was in Hawaii for a week on a stunt job. My parkour buddy Ozzy lived there, so he showed me around the island of Oahu where the production was filming. Along with his loyal and agile dog Roxy, we hiked up a mountain into the jungle. Some of the trees dropped these edible mountain apples along the path that we snacked on while we hiked. They are pretty tasty. Actually, I later learned that Polynesian voyagers are credited for introducing this tree species to Hawaii from Asia centuries ago. At one point we reached a 30 foot vertical waterfall on a river, and Ozzy showed me how the rocks behind the waterfall had deep pockets that you could use to climb directly up the waterfall rock face as this cool water washed over you. It was incredible. So we rock climbed up that one and several more waterfalls, while Roxy found a dog friendly route upstream. We also did other cool stuff like swimming in the ocean, camping on the beach, training parkour with his local crew. While Hawaii is an expensive place to live, I admired how Ozzy was able to create a simple and low impact, but also rich and fulfilling way of life there, in sharp contrast to the overbuilt tourist infrastructure around the hotel I was booked at. Originally, the Hawaiian Islands were inhabited by the skilled seafaring Polynesian people that I mentioned earlier. These ancient Hawaiians found a way to live in relative balance with the natural constraints of the islands, and were able to maintain their culture sustainably for over a thousand years. However, in the 1820s, European sailors came to the Hawaiian Islands, bringing diseases that killed 75% of the native population. Ever the opportunists, European Americans then overthrew the weakened kingdom of Hawaii, making it a U.S. territory. And soon enough, the mega hotels started moving in. This all made me wonder, why do some cultures find a way to balance their needs with the limits of their environment, while other cultures seem to become these all-consuming, ever-expanding monsters? I found some clues in biology and ecology. In 1944, 29 reindeer were introduced to St. Matthew Island off the coast of Alaska. With no natural predators, their population grew to 6,000 and rapidly depleted the food sources on the island. Then, after one long winter in 1963, their population crashed due to starvation, and eventually died out completely by 1980. The general pattern here is that when an organism like the reindeer discovers a rich energy source or habitat, it's a signal to breed. But as the population grows without natural predators to keep them in balance, or some cultural technology such as self-awareness, their consumption eventually exceeds the rate at which the food source is naturally replenished. This is also known as the habitat's carrying capacity. When their consumption exceeds the carrying capacity, they're essentially stealing food from their own future offspring. Unless the reindeer suddenly have an ecological epiphany and change their culture, not exactly a common thing for reindeer to do, this trend leads to an eventual population collapse, either through die-off or migration to new lands. This process is known as ecological overshoot. And we can even observe this pattern in bacteria in a petri dish, who will continue multiplying until they cover the entire dish and then die off en masse by running out of food and drowning in their own waste. Two quick side branches. I'll be using the term sustainable a lot, even though I know that mainstream advertising has exploited the meaning of this term to the point where it's almost impotent. So this is a good time to establish a firm operational definition. A community is sustainable if its population and consumption remain below 
the rate at which its environment naturally regenerates the resources they depend on. Second side note, talk of population limits often draws up the dark past of Malthusian population control efforts like eugenics. Obviously, I don't condone such programs. Addressing population issues is best achieved through voluntary choice. But in order for that to work, requires awareness of these limits and dynamics, which is why I'm going to discuss it, and why we can't just ignore the issue of population constraints out of shame for what happened in the past. Thank you for coming to my side branch talk. Do you think this process of overshoot plays out for humans as well? Or has modern society solved the problem? Looking back at history, many once vast and powerful civilizations, like the ancient Mayans and ancient Egyptians, eventually declined and faded into history because they depleted their ecological resource base. Not even the skilled Polynesians were always spared this fate. There's a small island in the Pacific that was once inhabited by Polynesians called Mangareva Island. Over time, excessive logging by the islanders resulted in deforestation that eroded their biological life support system to the point of civil wars, starvation, and possibly cannibalism. It's becoming clear that it really matters how a culture relates to and interacts with the living ecological community of their local land base. For instance, China's Los Plateau is the cradle of ancient Chinese civilization and was one of the first places where people became primarily dependent on sedentary grain agriculture about 10,000 years ago. Cereal grains like wheat and millet are grown in large plots that are cleared of all existing vegetation through burning or plowing the soil, and then planted to grow only that single species of plant. Now the tricky thing about plowing land or tilling is that it creates a short-term boost in soil fertility. But over long-term time frames, tillage agriculture gradually depletes the topsoil through nutrient leaching and erosion. This leads to a pattern of diminishing returns where the same amount of labor on the same plot of land yields lower and lower output over time. To maintain the same food production for their population, the people continued expanding up the hillsides, clearing forests to convert them into farmland. Once the trees were removed from these sloped areas, the soils eroded quickly, no longer being held in place by the plant roots. In the Los Plateau, what was once called the Great River is now known as the Yellow River, due to the continued erosion of yellow soil sediment entering the waterway. Any trees that tried to grow in these areas would often be eaten by livestock like sheep and goats, preventing the forests and soils from re-establishing naturally, which left the people and the landscape trapped in a cycle of impoverishment. After thousands of years of grain agriculture, expansion, and deforestation, this once lush landscape was transformed into an infertile and harsh desert through a process called desertification. As crop yields decline and the society is forced to expand into new fertile territories, any existing inhabitants of those new territories would often be conquered or assimilated. Cultures that depend on an unsustainable form of agriculture tend to develop the skills and tools of conquest because moving on to the next new territory is part of their survival strategy. By contrast, Sustainable societies tend to have less need to invest in warfare. On top of that is the fact that sedentary agricultural societies live in closer proximity to their domesticated livestock, which causes higher rates of disease and pathogens. I mean, guess where chickenpox came from? Or the swine flu? This biological factor seems to have aided in the spread of unsustainable colonial cultures, like how the ancient Hawaiians were decimated by the diseases of the European explorers. I've noticed that I have this mental habit of always chasing like the next new exciting thing, whether it's a new sport like parkour or the latest scientific research or new business ideas like internet marketing. I have this sense that I'll finally find happiness and fulfillment after I achieve my next goal or complete my next project. I sometimes wonder if this mentality is partly rooted in these inherited patterns of unsustainable colonial cultures who are always looking to the next fertile green pastures just over the horizon. Anyways, expansionistic cultures that depend on unsustainable practices have unfortunately pretty much expanded and dominated all corners of the globe. And now they're armed to the teeth with weapons and tactics of conquest, 
but no new territories to conquer. This has left these superpowers in this awkward state where their enormous investments in warfare are no longer applicable to their survival, and in fact are now a threat to it. The invention of massive fossil fuel farming machines has only accelerated the process of land degradation. Even the chemical pesticides and herbicides that modern ag has become dependent on originated during military research into chemical warfare during World War II. So these tools of conquest are now being deployed directly against our ecological land base in the form of these chemicals. Today, one-fifth of Earth's land area is degraded, including more than half of all agricultural land. Each year, a total land area the size of Germany or New Mexico is lost to desertification, land degradation, and drought. And according to the UN, 90% of the world's farmland could be degraded by 2050 if we don't dramatically change our land management practices. So it seems us hip and savvy postmodern humans are not immune from the pattern of ecological overshoot either. Are we just doomed then? Are humans inherently a plague species on the planet, as a popular narrative goes? Well, there are some cases that contradict this narrative. Traveling back to Hawaii now, and back in time before the 19th century colonization, the native Hawaiians had developed a sustainable land management system called the Ahu Puaha system. Just 6% of the land was used for farming, and yet they produced enough food to feed a population of 1 million. That means the same system, if implemented today, could likely feed the majority of the current population of Hawaii sustainably. Each volcanic island was divided into separate self-sustaining land management zones following the natural boundaries of the watershed. This makes sense because any decisions made upstream of a settlement should also involve those who will experience the literal downstream effects of those decisions. The steep mountainous slopes near the top of the Ahu Puaha were considered sacred, so there were strong restrictions on what could be harvested there. Whether consciously understood or not, there was a pearl of cultural wisdom in holding these forests, the Wau Akua, as sacred, since clear-cutting them would cause a cascade of negative consequences, just like we saw at the Lus Plateau in China. Moving down the mountains to the more gently sloping valleys, these areas were often used for terrace crops like taro and trees like the koa used for making dugout canoes. Each household had their respective duty, or kuleana, to provide for the community, whether they fished and lived near the coast, or farmed and made canoes upslope. And all these resources were shared amongst the whole community. A formal system of taboos, kapu, placed restrictions on harvesting certain fish and plants, ensuring that they didn't draw down the land's carrying capacity. The average Hawaiian likely spent less time working, farming, and doing chores than our modern lifestyles, and more time in social and leisure activities like hula dancing, music, and surfing. Sounds like utopia, huh? Well, before you pack your bags and hop in your time machine, there are some nuances to appreciate first. Despite their ecological benevolence, the ancient Hawaiians also sustained a powerful monarchy and caste system of imposed labor, and women were not permitted to eat many of the foods that men ate, such as pork, coconut, or bananas. Breaking one of these social taboos, even unintentionally, was punishable by death. While it's important not to look down on traditional societies as primitive and inferior, it's also important not to idealize them as perfect utopias. Going further, traditional and indigenous societies aren't all the same. Some are sustainable, some aren't. Some are violent and patriarchal, some aren't. Some no longer exist today, but many do, and are threatened by ongoing economic colonialism. In the Northern Territory of Australia, the native Aboriginal people are fighting to stop the expansion of lead and zinc mining that's contaminating their lands and way of life. Zinc is an essential ingredient in so-called green solar and wind energy generators. There's a huge diversity of practices, beliefs, and traditions within indigenous cultures. That being said, there are some distinguishing trends or patterns amongst more sustainable cultures that we do well to consider. They tend to combine small-scale agriculture with hunting, fishing, and foraging to provide a more diverse diet, which leads to better health and a lower impact on their environment. 
Based on the study of skeletal remains of people in the Mediterranean during the transition from nomadic lifestyles to settled agriculture, it was found that their average lifespan decreased by a few years, and the height of the average male dropped by seven inches after the adoption of agriculture. The great improvements in average lifespans that we enjoy today didn't appear with farming 10,000 years ago, but came much later with the advent of modern medicine in the early 1900s. Indigenous cultures that aren't overly reliant on large-scale agriculture rarely have to work more than 15 hours per week, allowing them free time to spend on other purposeful activities, such as making music and exploring or decorating their bodies and socializing. So traditional cultures, while imperfect, can still provide us a glimpse of a better, more sustainable, and healthier future. The unsustainable Mangarevans, who went extinct by deforesting their island, and the sustainable ancient Hawaiians, both originated from the same Polynesian peoples. These examples make it clear that the human species is not inherently some all-consuming, ever-expanding monster, a disease on the earth. It's natural for a species to keep reproducing without some external control mechanism, such as predators or resource limits. But as we've seen, it's also possible for human cultures to develop internal control mechanisms to prevent overshoot, like social norms and self-imposed limits on population and consumption. Societies become the all-consuming monster when they adopt certain unsustainable cultural patterns that have sadly conquered and infected their way around the globe and into our thoughts, beliefs, and value systems, our speech and behavior patterns. But the good news is that culture is something that we all co-create, so we can change it. New research shows that some of the most biologically diverse regions, like the Amazon rainforest and the tropical highlands of Southeast Asia, are the results of generations of sustainable management practices of the indigenous peoples living there. Clues like this hint at the potentially positive role we can learn to play in the larger living landscape. Remember how the Los Plateau in China was desertified for thousands of years? In the 1990s, the World Bank initiated a project that involved hiring the locals to regenerate their own land. Look at what was possible in just 15 years. This project also lifted millions of people out of poverty. Locals who grew up impoverished and illiterate were able to send their children to some of the top universities due to the increased productivity of their land. There is a suite of agricultural methods called regenerative agriculture that actually regenerate the ecological health of the land while producing a yield sustainably. Some examples of these methods include cover cropping, agroforestry, and intensive grazing. While natural processes can take 500 years to generate one inch of topsoil, regenerative methods can build an inch of topsoil in just a few years time. That's something like 100 times faster. And these methods actually pull carbon dioxide out of the air and sequester it in the soils, helping to mitigate climate change. And this can be done while restoring ecological health and producing nutrient dense foods on the same land. So not only are truly sustainable societies possible in intact ecosystems, but it's also possible to reverse desertification and work with nature to heal and regenerate these damaged landscapes using practices like ecosystem restoration and regenerative agriculture. And you better believe that marketing teams are already working hard to dilute and greenwash the meaning of these new terms, just like they did with organic and sustainable. Ecosystem restoration is still a very new science, and I think it's important to approach it with humility instead of repeating the same mistakes of the past by going big before we put in the proper practice. Instead, I think we need to see nature as our teacher and partner in this healing work. We're just a part of nature after all. So a wise approach is to start with many small scale experiments. Just like in parkour, how you start by practicing precision jumps to a curb. Even something as small as an urban backyard or the buffer between apartment buildings is a good start. Try a few different planting strategies and species. Then pay attention, you know, note the results and build on what works. And don't forget to put a little love into it. This careful approach leaves room for surprises, for the unknown mysteries at the heart of life to emerge on their own and teach us new things. I wonder if there was a point when the Mangareven Islanders noticed their quality of life was eroding and they were becoming more miserable. But instead of acknowledging their reality and working to live within the biological limits of their island, they clung to their old faith that if they 
carved beautiful enough wooden tiki sculptures to honor the god Rango, their god of abundance, that he would magically solve their problems. Today, our island in ecological overshoot is the earth, and our sacred tiki sculptures are the machines of technology and invention. Our modern myth of perpetual progress tells us to have faith that if we just build better machines, then we'll be saved. And the people bowed and prayed to the neon god they made. I think there's much more untapped potential in developing cultural technologies, like the kind that allowed the Polynesians to navigate vast open oceans using only the plants, animals, sea currents, and stories they carried with them. We don't need to follow in the footsteps of the Mangarevans or the St. Matthew Island deer. We can learn from the past and choose a different path. As we're floating out here on our rickety canoe in the vast ocean of possible futures, we have many stories passed down from the old timers to help us find the way. Stories like the ancient Hawaiian Ahu Puaha system, or the regeneration of the Los Plateau in China. And as we learn to heal the land, perhaps we can also heal the social fragmentation, isolation, and violence inherited from unsustainable cultures of conquest. We'll never really know until we try, but it seems like a worthwhile challenge to work towards together. So, lace up, friends. We've got some training to do.